Gordon, I, I did hear that he was gay. Uh, he was dead. Where did that come from? I'm not sure. What. The, wow. I should probably just. Mm. Can we start? Can we start today over? I can blame the time change, right? Anyway, so with with lines like my t- my time was running wild and time may change me, in. Uh, in this song, you may be able to sympathize with David's pain. I certainly can, as you can see. Um, getting out of bed this morning was really difficult, and apparently it's just continued to be difficult <laughs> now that we've entered daylight saving time, savings time. Um, many of you may already know, interestingly enough, that tomorrow, the Monday after daylight savings time begins, always shows a significant increase in car accidents. Are you guys aware of this? Um, certainly this morning, uh, I realized I was a little you know, more tired, less alert. It was a little harder than usual to text and drive. <laughs> LOL, winky face, exclamation point. Um, thankfully, uh, we all made it here safely this morning. What you may also not know is that actually the Monday after daylight saving time ends, when you fall back, it also shows a significant increase in car accidents. So it's not just getting more or less sleep, but just actually the change itself that causes the problem, and that's because change is always difficult. And certainly change is difficult not just when it means losing an hour of sleep, but oftentimes we lose sleep not because of daylight saving time, but because we're looking at our lives and realize that they're not perhaps what we'd like them to be, right? We feel like we should be somebody else and that time is not on our side. And that, at least in part, seems to be some of what David Bowie is singing about. And he has the line, there's going to have to be a different man, right? There's this sense that I've got to change. And over the last several weeks, we've been in our series, The Generosity Ladder. And hopefully, um, each one of us has been challenged to make some ch-ch-ch-changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you'll remember, (laughs) what we said was that the generosity ladder is this tool that we use to climb out of this pit of financial stress and arrive at a place of financial peace. Kind of how we go from that trapped place of kind of uh, selfishness and scarcity to a mentality of freedom and charity and hospitality and abundance where we find ourselves freely able to give what we have to others, right, to share what we've been blessed with. And so to do that, we've said that it begins with having kind of a kingdom perspective on money. Um, So obviously, we go to the source, we go to Jesus, and we're talking about that perspective. In Luke 16, Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? So Jesus here kind of uh, connects the idea of our faithfulness and finances with faithfulness in other areas. And sort of, uh, and Dan can probably tell you this, but Richard Rohr is fond of saying, how you do anything is how you do everything, right? That there's this sense that if you get angry and impatient in traffic, then you probably also get angry and impatient with your children or with the bank teller, right? Or even with God that we have a tendency to say things like, well, I'm generous with my time, but not with my money. Or I'll give my money, but I don't have time to serve. Um, or this idea that I can like be like ruthless and uncompromising at work, but somehow I'm still going to magically be kind to my wife, right? We kind of segment our life in that way. But there seems to be this transitive property with regard to life that progress in one area seems to lead to progress in another. Um, Research shows, for example, that when you start exercising self-discipline in the area of physical exercise, you're also better at exercising self-discipline with regard to your finances or with your eating habits. And so, once again, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Um, And progress in one area tends to kind of bleed over. So Jesus is always encouraging us, though, to start right where we're at. And so even if we feel like we have little that's still an opportunity to be faithful, right? And it doesn't disqualify us from being a generous person or sharing what we do have. So the point is you just have to start somewhere. We said that the first step is just giving an intentional gift, right? An an initial intentional gift. Um, And then we move second to that obedience level giving, uh, which is basically giving regularly and proportionally, committing to tithing 10%. So it's not about you know, whether you're giving more or less than the person sitting next to you, because it's about whether you're faithful with what you have, right? Whether that's little or much. 
And lastly, we move to what we call peak level giving, right, which is where we begin to live these wildly generous lives, right, giving to the church and to those in need freely, joyfully, and abundantly, where we just become generous people, right? And so when it comes to money, though, uh, many, if not most of us, probably feel a little bit like the little guy rather than the big kahuna. And so certainly we're going to look at another little guy uh, briefly here named Zacchaeus. Some of you may have heard of him. And we learned something about Jesus and generosity in that story. Uh, now in Luke chapter 19, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. And since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So his, desi his desire to see Jesus manifests in him making some of these changes, right, and in taking some action. So he climbs up to see Jesus, and this ends up in his having dinner with Jesus, right? So we watch what happens next. Um, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of all my possessions to the poor, and I have cheated anybody out of anything. I will pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. And so it's, it's interesting. Jesus sees some of... Uh, <laughs> The actions that he's taking towards generosity is almost being evidence that he's this changed man, right? And so, and as Zacchaeus gets close to Jesus, he just naturally is becoming more generous, right? He decides to change his life, which means not only, again, inviting Jesus into his heart, as we're fond of saying, um, but in making restitution and in actually in enacting a serious financial commitment. So the, the generosity of Jesus kind of bubbles up inside him and works outward through his whole life. And, the, and again, our, our little guy becomes a big giver in that sense. So this morning we're saying as you climb the generosity ladder, you move closer to God. So there's this sense, you know, I said that we have this kind of like seg segmented way that we tend to live our lives uh, where we say I'll be generous in this area but not that area. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you tell your spouse like, I love you, but we are not going to have a joint bank account. Uh, might cause some problems, potentially. On the other hand, when we begin to see our resources as belonging to God and allowing him full access in that way, um, the relationship continues to grow, right? And so the goal of becoming more generous is not simply to bless our church and the people around us, though certainly that's wonderful and that's one of the uh, primary reasons we do it, but also because we're blessed in the process as we begin to trust God with everything we have and become generous just as he is generous. So there's this sense that as we let God even maybe into what is for some of us that last area that we're hesitant to let him into, um, there's that sense that there's this closeness that comes along with that. So speaking of being close to God, I would like to welcome to the stage a man who scales these rungs and speaks in tongues, a man who gives thanks all the way to the bank, a man who ascends the heights of giving and receives dividends from righteous living, a man who devoutly and doggedly denies radically resistantly repudiating the asinine assertion that the top of the ladder is not a step. Our associate pastor, Brian Fox. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Well, again, I tend to be a literal person, so I just went ahead and brought my ladder with me. I would like to just go ahead and make you aware that I am willing, because this is one of the work ladders that we use here in the church, I'm very willing to make it available to any of you who would like to come by on any given day and replace light bulbs or sheetrock or whatever it is that you think would be helpful out of the generosity of my heart, this ladder is available to you. <laughs> yeah. As we close out our series on the generosity ladder, I want to point us back to this idea that the more generous we become, the more Christ-like we become. Our God is a God of generosity. He has always been the provider for His people. In Hebrew, uh, one of the names for God 
is Jehovah Jireh, which translates God the provider. It's one of the terms they used in the Hebrew language to refer to God that reminded him he wasn't just God the creator, he wasn't just God on the throne, he was God the provider. And it comes out of his interaction with Abraham where he provided the ram so that Abraham's son would not be sacrificed on the altar. Again, a foreshadowing of the providing of Jesus. In Malachi 3, the prophet, speaking the words of God, says, Test me in regard to giving. Give me the tithe and watch me open the floodgates of heaven on your behalf. God's words to his people. And then the writer of Hebrews reminds his readers in the closing comments of his letter, Hebrews 13, 5, he says, Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. My paraphrase of Hebrews 13, 5, trust God. Don't let money become a barrier between you and Him. And be content. Let Him decide what you need. What is truly a need so as to distinguish what are the wants and the things that we may need to set aside. When we talk about giving, I don't know that I've ever talked about it that somebody didn't say, well, but yeah, you know, the whole rich young ruler thing. I mean, you don't really think God would call us to give up everything to follow Him, like to, to give everything away. No, I don't think you would. Unless that's the one thing that stands between you and Him. And in the American culture today, for how many people is that the one thing that stands between them and God? Just a basic level of trust. I'll let Him be my provider. I'll be dependent on God as opposed to dependent on my own ability to earn. I don't know where God's calling you specifically in this area of generosity. <clears throat> But Paul wrote to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. The idea that I, I pursue being like God, and I'm content with that. When he says that's great gain, it's as if that's, that's kind of the ultimate pinnacle. That's the top of the ladder. That's as good as it gets. And again, the insinuation there is that that that's, should be enough. <laughs> Godliness with contentment. So climbing the generosity ladder helps you rise above worry, envy, pride, self-centeredness, materialism, and debt. So again, the first part of those uh, that list. I know it's a long one. You got plenty of time to write it down because I'm fixing to preach every point. And um, since we since we sprung forward an hour, yeah, I know you. We got plenty of time today. Um, <laughs> by making that a long list, it wasn't just to uh, you know encourage you with writer's cramp or or you know whatever other problems that would cause. I wanted you to see that this is not just about, again, generosity allowing us to move toward godly character, but there are also some practical benefits that are also part of, of that godly character. We've said from the very beginning that if we climb the generosity ladder, that it, it moves us away from, it allows us to let go of the worry of financial stress. That one's easy. We've talked about it throughout, so let me move on. But it also allows us to rise above envy, the bondage of wanting what everybody else has. Again, the idea of keeping up with the Joneses. I, I can honestly say I've never known a family by the name of Jones that had a lot of money, but, but at some point that worked. So... Uh, but we do. It's hard not to look at what other people have and go, wow, that would be nice. And then it's, it's a, 
a short step from there to, wow, I really need that myself. And then there's the pride that we're able to rise above when we let go of those things. The idea that I deserve this more than others because I worked hard to get it. It's what I did by myself. It's, it's what I was able to accomplish. Now, guys, I'm, I'm speaking these things as a part of the preach, but recognize I do not believe having money is, is bad or evil or sinful. I don't believe any of that. I'm saying that when we find ourselves content and not worrying about money, there are a lot of things we're able to let go of that make us more like God, and these are all some of those things. In the very first sermon, we talked about that this generosity ladder is based on a new paradigm, a new way of thinking, so that I know that everything belongs to God, and what He gives me is going to be enough, and I can be okay with that. It allows us to rise above self-centeredness. How many of you have felt really good about your life? You've been in a place in your life where you were very focused internally, very focused on yourself, and you felt really good about life at that point. Any, I don't see any hands, but I'm not necessarily asking because I don't, you know, don't want to put you on the spot. But typically, when everything's focused on us, life is not that good. We're not... Again, depression sets in. We can always find things that we are lacking when we just look at ourselves. But when we look outside of ourselves, things change. It also allows us to rise above materialism, which again, the, the definition, uh, the uh, dictionary definition of materialism is a tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort as more important than spiritual values. Wouldn't it be nice to move beyond that? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to be able to focus on what God has for us and what, what He provides as opposed to all the periphery, all the things around us? Now, again, yes, cars break down, and for most of us, they have to be fixed or I can't go work. There, there are those things, but it doesn't consume us. And then the last thing it allows us to rise above is debt, which is a very practical thing. Guys, debt is a bondage. And there may be times for all of us that there's some element. Most of us are, probably have to have a mortgage. As I was preparing this, one of the things I mentioned to the, the preaching team is, it is actually to my benefit to have a mortgage because I get a, uh, a, a blessing from the IRS because I get to write that off. I know that only works for pastors or clergy folks. But a housing allowance, that's how it works for, for, the, for pastors and clergy. So it's to my benefit to have that. But overall... Talk to anyone who is... in in a significant amount of debt, and they'll say, I, I, I'm burdened. They'll use terms like, I feel like I'm weighed down by it. They'll say things like, I don't feel like I can do what God wants me to do because I have this weighing over me. It, it um, reminds me of the wonderful song of, the, uh, uh, of Snow White's friends, the dwarves, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. I'm not really up on Disney. I'm, I'm relearning some of those. But um, at this point, <laughs> but a familiar phrase, debt's bondage, It is regardless. And again, there may be some elements of that that we've got to work through. But climbing this generosity ladder, as we've talked about it, some of the very practical steps move us toward getting out of debt. Uh, one of uh, we've done testimonies and, and talked about 
quotes from some of our folks, from some of you as we've gone along, so I've got one of those for you now, I hope. Here we go. Go. Back during the summer when we were getting to ready to move, we were getting hit with a lot of extra deposits and things we weren't prepared for, but we were totally unwilling to stop tithing to do that. And in the process, people come around us and made sure that we had what we needed to, to pay the deposits that we could move in with little stress as possible. Um, we didn't have to set up any kind of special funds or anything. God just made, made that happen. And he's always been really faithful to do that whenever we need um, something. We never have had to go without. And, and that's why we faithfully tithe. So again, the, the Zimmermans are a testimony to this idea that if I trust God, if I continue to be generous in my life, that I'll see it paid back. Uh, again, God the provider. Romans 13 says this, Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay them. Again, this is Paul reminding those folks in Rome who are in difficult circumstances that they need to keep up with the responsibilities they have in the financial realm. If it's revenue, if you owe somebody because they worked for you, then, then pay them. But also, if it's respect, then respect. If it's honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the, continu the continuing debt to love one another. Again, Paul takes the focus off the financial aspects, recognizing that the financial aspects are there. But he says, ultimately, by fulfilling your responsibilities, by being a generous person, you show love. And I think, uh, if I remember right, it was John that said that's how people would know that we belong to the Father, is by our love. So Paul, in writing to Timothy, again, a young pastor trying to encourage him in his own personal life, but also in how he preaches and teaches as he's in the church there uh, in, um, is it Ephesus or Corinth? I just lost it. I didn't look that up, and it's not in my notes. So somebody will fact check me on that. Uh, but here's what he says in 1 Timothy 6. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Paul's closing information, the, the closing part of his letter to this young pastor about his church gives two insights, not only for Timothy's life, but for those he's teaching. Talk about giving. Talk about living generously. Recognize that there is a financial aspect to that, but it's so much bigger than that. And he closes with this phrase, uh, so they build a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, again, for those of us good uh, fundamentalists, evangelicals, we would read that and we're thinking heaven. You do this so you get to go to heaven. Guys, the coming age, remember, in, the, in a kingdom theology, is not about heaven. It's about Jesus having brought the age here, and we get to experience it now. So Paul's not saying, do this so that someday, maybe, if you're lucky, you'll get to go to heaven. He's saying, do this because it will show in your life now that the kingdom of God is present, and He's here, and He's a part of what you're doing. It's powerful. Generous lives reveal the kingdom of God in and through us. 
There's an example from Acts as I was putting these things together again. I, I wanted today, rather than trying to give you a lot of biblical interpretation or, or try to convince you uh, by uh, the commands, the biblical commands that you need to be better givers, my goal today is to give you stories and examples that demonstrate that when we're generous, we become more like God, but we also receive the blessings of God. And so it brought to mind this guy in Acts named Barnabas. Now, I'm going to cover uh, Barnabas' life from the perspective of the concordance of your Bible, okay? So I'm going to uh, I'm not proof texting, go back and read it all, but I'm, I'm jumping so that you get the snippets of pictures that Acts gives us because it doesn't have, nobody ever wrote Barnabas' biography in a single spot, okay? It's kind of scattered through Acts. So, again, go back and look it up if you're questioning it. But the first time we hear about Barnabas is in Acts chapter 4. Joseph, as he was called then, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas because, again, they gave him a new name that meant son of encouragement based on this first interaction with him. And that interaction was that he sold a field he owned, he brought the money, put it at the apostles' feet. So the first indication we have a Barnabas interaction in the New Testament is a demonstration of financial generosity. And it was by that generosity that the apostles and the, those who were leaders in the church went, wait, there, there's something about this guy. I see good stuff in him. So then we see in Acts chapter 9, the next time that he's mentioned, that when, when Saul, a persecutor of the church, who's now been converted, con, converted? <laughs> converted when he, Saul, came to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing he was really a disciple. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So we see Barnabas's generos the generosity of his life is not just about his financial generosity. He's also generous in his relationships with people. He's generous to extend himself on behalf of somebody else who needs someone to stand up for him. So we're moving beyond just what it means to be financially generous, but we're seeing this lived out in his life now in his relationships and the way he interacts with people how he treats Saul specifically. And then in Acts 11, news of this, meaning the, uh, uh, the expanse of the church, the expanding of the church in Antioch, that news reaches the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad. He encouraged them to remain true to the Lord in their hearts. And he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Wow, that'd be great. Let's, if it ended right there, that would be wonderful, right? So Barnabas gives him, he leaves his home in Jerusalem. He moves to Antioch. He becomes a missionary. And these great things are happening. People are seeing the Spirit of God on him. Wouldn't that be enough? Probably would for most of us. Particularly those of us who like the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, check this out here. I, I'm, I'm now becoming the chief elder in Antioch. All these good things God, are, God is doing in Antioch, and I'm in the spotlight. I like that. It makes me, again, it gives me purpose. It gives me meaning because I see God doing these things through me. If it were me, I'd have probably stayed in the spotlight a little longer. But here's what Barnabas does. All that's going on, and then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, who has been sent away because of the persecution, because people are trying to kill him, because he is such a good teacher. He is, his example, uh, his testimony is so powerful. So he goes and finds him, 
and he brings him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. So Barnabas again shows great generosity toward Saul, but he also shows the generosity toward the church in Antioch. He doesn't hold the spotlight on himself. He's like, Saul could really help out here. These people would be blessed by this guy named Saul. I'm going to go find him. Guys, we're not talking about a short trip. A multi-day trip to get to Tarsus to find Saul and to bring him back. Again, the demonstration of generosity in his life. And then finally, in Acts 13, we see the final mention of Barnabas' generous living in this context. Barnabas and Saul are serving in the church in Antioch. Things are going great. When their names are mentioned in chapter 13, it's always Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas' name being mentioned first indicates he's the leader in this, in this partnership, in this duo But halfway through that chapter, we see a shift in the text. And from the middle of chapter 13 in Acts through the end of Acts, when when Barnabas and Saul are mentioned, it's reversed. Paul has been given a new name based on his new him being a new creation in Christ. And from that point on, anytime their names are mentioned together, it's now Paul and Barnabas. Paul takes the role as the primary leader in their relationship, in their leaderships uh, with the church. You know, this is really hard to imagine in our culture. In fact, in our culture, it's hard to even find stories that portray this. Batman trains up Robin, and then it becomes Robin and Batman. That never happens. It's always Batman and Robin. Robin never gets the the lead position. I I was reminded of one incident where where it comes about that way. We do see this kind of transition in in a beautiful story called Kung Fu Panda. Where where the uh where the the student becomes the teacher and he becomes the head and, and the one over. Uh, the one who's in charge, the more powerful. But, you know, the occurrence even in that story is so ridiculous that that's placed in the genre of comedy. Okay, it's not a real story. Pandas don't really become ninjas and fight off evil. So it should be a comedy. Okay, I'll give you that. But, again... (laughs) I I literally, I thought, oh, there's got to be other places in our culture where there's stories or there's something where we see this portrayed where, you know, the teacher raises up the student, and while the teacher is still viable and working, the the student becomes the leader. I know some of you are going to remind me of some some of you. I can see your mind spinning. You're thinking, yeah, okay, I'm going to come up with it, and I'll tell him later. Please do. But for the most part, that's not the way stories in our culture are told. The only way the, the student becomes the teacher is if the teacher dies. Our culture has problem even connecting with this idea that a teacher would allow the student to actually become their mentor. They would actually allow them to move into a position where they're above them. Because our culture doesn't think that way. And yet in the kingdom of God, we see it lots of times because it's an upside-down kingdom. It's the kind of kingdom where the last become first, where the student becomes the teacher, where as Jesus told his disciples, I no longer call you students, but I call you friends. Because now we share this plane. 
Climbing the generosity ladder elevates us so we can experience the joy, peace, and freedom of the kingdom life. Guys, this, this is a, it's a kingdom principle. And it's part of the upside-down kingdom because it, it just doesn't work. Again, like I say, even in story form, we don't see it happening in our culture today. So here's what that means. As you give, you're becoming more like God, and in turn, He draws you into a life of blessing and peace that only He can offer. God is the ultimate example of a generous giver. He gave more than money. He gave His Son. Giving is motivated by love, so God loved us, and He gave. So if we love Him, we in turn will give. Now, every one of us needs the Spirit of God to work in us and through us to break the selfishness that's in us and to allow us to move into this life of blessing. And that, that, doesn't, that power can't or is not found in us unless we first give our lives to God. The way you handle money is one of the most important aspects of your life. Again, it's one of the uh, consistent topics mentioned in Scripture both in Old Testament and in New. Your financial decisions will influence the other areas of your life. And the only way to honor God in that way is to become more generous and to allow God the position uh, to be on the throne of your life as opposed to you being there. So Matthew 5.48 and the message, ouch. That's... (laughs) In, in Matthew 5, 48 in the message, again, if you look this up in the NIV, uh, Eugene Peterson is not trying in any way to do a translation. There's not a single word in this verse that's going to translate back to the Greek. <laughs> so I'm going to give you that. But I do think he's, I, what he's trying to do is capture this idea that Jesus is giving his disciples in regard to the way they live, Okay. So in a word, what I'm saying is, Jesus talking to the disciples, grow up. Your kingdom subjects, so live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. We probably should list that as a quote from Eugene as opposed to a scripture, because like I say, it's... If you go look at it in the NIV, it's it's not even close as a translation. But I believe he captures a kingdom principle there that I that I needed that when I read it, I just that resonated in me. Your kingdom subjects live like it. Live generously and graciously the way God lives toward you. So as we wrap up the series, let me remind you of of just some some practical ways that this generosity ladder is identifiable for us, okay? Many of these are going to be principles we talked about, but we are talking specifically about financial matters, so that's where the application is. First thing, and these are on your notepad there, so you got them at the bottom, Determine your priorities. Financial peace has nothing to do with how much you make. It has to do with how much you spend or how much you give. When you put God first by honoring Him with the tithe, by choosing to live within your means, you have your financial priorities in order. Again, in our culture, it's a paradigm shift. It's a different way of thinking. The second thing that's very practical, decide to get out of debt. Getting out of debt's a process that begins with a decision. Decide you're not going to keep increasing your debt. You're not going to buy things you can't afford, but you're going to create a plan and, and pay down the debt that you have so that you can learn to be content. It's practical, but it's important. If we're not, again, it's so easy. I, I, I live by financially 
uh, Dave Ramsey's principles on financial peace. He and I don't always agree on, uh, sometimes I think he's a little dogmatic, but I believe in and live by the principles. And one of them is getting out of debt. Discipline yourself in small financial ways. It's not a matter of, okay, this week I'm going to cut off, I'm going to end my debt. I'm going to start living this way. I mean, if you've got the money, great. If you know, if you've got ten thousand in credit card debt and ten thousand in the CD, it makes sense financially to pay that off. But if you did, you wouldn't have the debt to begin with, probably. Right? I mean, so this is not something that's a snap decision. We find ways to start giving something somehow. Let me take a little bit and start. And then we discipline ourselves. And it may be little things. It may be one less Starbucks run. It may be, um, did, I hear, did I hear a groan over that? I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but we all have little ways. And again, those small changes have a snowball effect over time. Discover the joy of generosity. Generosity is a way of life. Practice living an open-handed life each and every day, not just in your finances, but in all areas. And then the last thing, again, the, maybe the most practical of all, is adopt, adopt a habit of now. Find some way to start today. It's just like anything else that requires discipline in our lives. you got to, you know... I love the phrase by a, a mentor that I heard in, in college, a guy who served as a mentor for me. He said, I'm just disciplined enough to figure out which sin is going to get me. Yeah, think about that. <laughs> I'm just disciplined enough to figure out which one's going to get me. <laughs> it's always easy to say <laughs> tomorrow. but find some way to start today. Life is too short and too important to live with stress, anxiety, and worry that come from not honoring God with your finances. So let's climb toward living a generous life so that we can become more like our Father and experience the kingdom of God in our present circumstances. Stand with me.